welcome to another episode of Grief Talk. Everything you want to know about grief and more. I'm your host, Vaughn Solis. As an author, mentor, and bereaved mom since 2005, through guest interviews and coaching, here's where you'll always get great content that is inspiring and practical to help you heal after loss. Today's guest is Stephen Panis. Now as an author and drawing on his 30-year career as a sports marketing executive, publicist, sports agent, artist, attorney, sports marketing executive, and motivational speaker representing elite athletes and others, the death of his son Jake, who at age 16 was killed as a passenger in a reckless car crash, led Stephen's life to implode. Seeking to both survive and move forward, he wrote his book, Walk On, to confront his daily agony, inspire a renewed and resilient faith in living, and regain his purpose. Walk On is intended to help anyone overcome struggle and find the answers within to help you lead a life filled with purpose and meaning. Stephen, welcome to uh, my show. I am thrilled that you are here with me. So huge thank you for being in this space with me and being willing to talk about your story. Thanks for having me, Vaughn. And I'm yeah. starting to share this pathway. Yes, me too. Um, but on the flip side, I am really happy for any voice uh, that is out there in the grief space because it's so important for the many that don't feel they have a voice or can speak or share their story for a host of reasons. It's people like you uh, and people like me and the probably thousands of others working in this space that, you know, have very similar things that we feel. I've been in this so long. I know we all feel and go through the same emotions, no matter how our child has died. And I want to start off, I have wished you uh, or expressed my condolences to you privately, but I will do it publicly here. I really, really uh, am uh, very, very sad for you that you had to lose your beautiful boy, Jake. Um, and we will hear uh, some of, of, about uh, your story and how that has impacted you. I also want to acknowledge our children with the candle I always have going when I have bereaved parents on this podcast, because I do believe our children are with us. So Jake, Jenea, that's for you. Uh, and so let's get right to it, uh, Stephen. I do want to just start off uh, and put it in context that you came from a 30-year, probably plus background in your sports marketing, like really high powered stuff. And um, I don't know if it was like athlete centric, but I got the feeling it kind of was. And so I found that really, really super interesting when I first connected with you. And by the way, audience, I did reach out to Stephen myself on, on LinkedIn and he graciously accepted my connection and I right away invited you to come on my show and you graciously accepted. And I was a little intimidated because of the sports thing. And I thought, you know what, this is going to be really super interesting, the vulnerability coming from that kind of background. And I'm sure you have a lot that you can address about that as well as we get going here. But let's start first with um, how your wor world imploded when you lost um, Jake. And this was in 2020 summer, right? And just share what you'd like to share with the audience about that. Yeah, so it, it happened on August 9th, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, Jake um, went away on a weekend trip with his girlfriend and her family to Block Island, uh, which is an island just off Rhode Island, about two hours from our home here in Connecticut. And um, he'd only been dating her about six weeks or so. And uh, it was supposed to be just a quiet family weekend each time, walk to town, ice cream, et cetera. And he, um, so we left on a Friday and on Sunday morning, we got a phone call that there had been an accident. Jake was injured and there was no other details. And so, um, we, we, my wife, Jake's little brother, Liam, who was 11 at the time and myself, um, quickly packed a bag of overnights and we hopped in the car and started speeding towards Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. About 12 minutes into the drive, when we received a phone call, uh, the most unwanted phone call ever from a doctor who introduced himself, paused, and then said, I'm sorry, I just pronounced your son dead. In, uh, in, a, in a phone call, because that's the way I found out my daughter died too, in a phone call, racing on the highway to her home. Oh, has, I, I'm going to ask you, just has that moment stuck with you, and does it haunt you? Or Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. 
there's there's just certain elements of it that you um I have oh, will ever shake. They're uh, it's just like ingrained in you, marked on you, um, mm-hmm. in indelible ways. Yeah. So just as a if it's a small comfort because it is to me, I now know. Okay, I'm not the only one that found out my daughter basically had died in a phone call, and you're trapped in this car, right? Fortunately, yeah, I, I wasn't driving. Were you driving? I was driving, and I was going fast, and I was bouncing between lanes. Holy Jesus! Yeah, everything yeah. black, and I just, I just, I recall slow attempting to get the car over to the right lane as fast as I could to get off the highway. Yep. Yep. We pulled off, and literally, I just pulled right off the exit, and there was a bank. It was a Sunday, and there was a bank across the street from the traffic light and I just went right through the light and pulled into an empty bank parking lot. And, uh, we just got out. We ran around the car in circles and we just fell together as one blob of kind of broken humanity. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so glad you're sharing that because this is something I've sort of kept quiet and I've, um, it, it destroyed me. That was the end of my life as I knew it in the car, in that, in those, in that second, uh, in those last words, which for me was she's gone. Ha! Huh, I even got chills just saying that now. And um, so I'm. we don't have to stay on that, but I'm just saying I'm acknowledging that as a piece of the trauma that I don't know how you could ever, anyone could ever um, sort of um, overcome. And, and the reason I'm saying that, because it's going to play into our, our talk today, <laughs> you know, resilience, staying motivated, but there are some things... Don't you think that, Stephen, that kind of like, I'm not sure we can ever really overcome that. Uh, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know. I, what do you think? I don't know. Um, I think you use the word trauma, and I think that's very important because that's exactly what happens to you. It, it is, um, for me, everything went black. I felt nothing. Um, I didn't be part of this world anymore. Yes. Yes, that was the moment. That was the moment. And um, I talk a lot about PTSD because I actually got diagnosed with it 10 years, like nine and a half years later. I suspected I had it, but we didn't talk about it. And so I started researching it for my first book, which took five years to write, by the way. And I got very interested in it. And uh, I had to get all my information from Veterans Affairs in the States. And I live in Canada. That tells you how little. And we still don't have anything really about PTSD in grief. Uh, like trauma related to grief and or child loss. Oh, it's a it's a big deal for sure. I mean, I know that my brain is not the same brain as it was before August 9th, 2020. It's damaged. It's I cannot re- remember things um, the way I used to be able to recall things. I'm, I'm t- just to, you know, I think you can relate to that. You're just not you're not the same person, obviously, but the. Um, your body and your brain and the, how you operate are completely different, and it's and, and it's, it's it's not easy with the damaged brain. Yeah, exactly. And while it takes a doctor, obviously, to diagnose the trauma and the PTSD, even if you don't have PTSD, the trauma is there and it does change the brain. I just want to let you know from all the research I've done, and um. The National Institute for the Center of Behavioral Medicine in the States, the NICABM, they do specialize in PTSD and trauma. And I was so happy that like a week ago, and as we're recording this, this is in February, but they announced their first ever training for therapists in trauma related to grief. And I was just, yes. And I'm a lay person, but they actually um, work with um you know, licensed uh, therapists. So while we're not going to, um, you know, linger on that today, my part in the, in the trauma piece is just to have people become aware that this may have impacted you. And if it has impacted you and further, if you've developed a disorder from it, literally your brain does not work the same way. (laughs) And if you don't understand that right from the beginning, you know, it really impacts decisions you make. Um, you're changing behaviors and, and questioning yourself 
and it can cause a lot of relationship breakdowns. It can, people can lose jobs, you know, cause money problems. Like there are a host of things that can happen when we have medical uh, issues uh, that have not been diagnosed. Um, so I'm just giving a shout out to that. Yeah. So you're in the parking lot. God. And, and I'm thinking now, do you have a decision? Well, you know you have to get driving again, right? But you also know you're driving towards, right, your basic future that's now obliterated. We didn't know what to do in the moment. And I, we, we, the doctor was still on the phone. And my wife talked to him. I don't recall hearing anything that was said. We concluded that um, the best thing for us to do in that moment was to go home. Um, and we, we were 12 minutes away. We returned home. And I called um, some good friends. I called my my mom first. Yeah. Then we called friends and told them. And so people just started coming over. And then I, I got on the phone with Rhode Island when I felt like I had somewhat of coherency to deal with it and, and just learn that there was going to be a process for um, getting my son's body home, that there was no... As much as we wanted to be there with them, there was no, there was no reason, and we wouldn't have got to see him right away. That because yeah. it was well, there was an accident, yeah, and it's going to be a whole police process. Um, he, the accident was that he was in, um, he was in a vehicle that was um, operated by his girlfriend, who was a year older, um, and with friends in the car. They had all been drinking. Mm -hmm. The they were at the beach. We went back to the house where the girlfriend's mom was and the girlfriend's mom sadly passed the keys to her daughter and put all the kids into the car and she went to the beach and sent them on their way and his girlfriend uh, became distracted I guess and she was going a, a little bit over the limit she went off the road and she uh, hit a telephone pole and Jake died yeah. Um, can I just ask, were there any other casualties from that accident or just Jake? Just Jake. Um, wow. One other was injured and he was helicoptered off the island. And But uh, everyone, he was the only one injured and yeah, he survived and he's in college now. Parent to parent. That's got to cause some conflicting feelings. Everything you just said, right? Does it? Or maybe it didn't. Maybe you are immediately like forgiving. Like it, this was an accident. Do you want to speak to that at all? Wow. You know, I've come to a place where I've found forgiveness for everybody involved. And so I'll just, uh, I like to stay there. We got sucked into a legal process where we had no place. We sort of got inside by the state attorney general's office and they involved us more than we initially wanted to be involved. And and we end up getting dragged in, and when you get dragged in like that, it's a it's a terrible roller coaster ride. Yeah, that bereaved parent needs to be on, and so it was a long year and a half of um, additional pain and suffering and grief yeah. and trauma. I'm glad you're bringing that up, actually, in a way because um, I discovered uh, I spent the first year, my husband and I. Uh, in a grief support group for bereaved parents. And it was really interesting because I um, I had had, at that point, a 23-year career in, I mean, practice in metaphysics and a spiritual practice, okay? So I always, I was already, there's more, there's an afterlife, there's ongoing consciousness, my girls, okay. But, but then, you know, there was still the physical part of that. But I was shocked at how many people, uh, the first thing they wanted to do was get into a legal battle if it had been an accident or, and I'm not saying for you, I'm just saying they want to be, but then it took me a few years and then I kind of understood that in, in survival mode and as part of the way even of dealing with trauma and aside from the actual real, like, like legal things that have to happen, um, it can be an energy release sometimes for parents on their own to initiate all kinds of conflict, not least, uh, you know, lawsuits and things like that. And that's why, but the same energy, this is my opinion, but the same energy can start an NGO, for example, or a scholarship fund or anything like that. It's that, uh, 
yeah, energy and throw it into. So it's really unfortunate for you and your wife that you got sucked into that when you really rather would have not have got sucked into that. Because on the flip side, when it is, uh, you know, combative and conflicting and all of this, um, as you said, it's just, it is painful, right? I wasn't involved in that. We were a suicide and we got left alone. So <laughs> it's like we were invisible. So um, that even hurt because it was like, does no one care? Does no one care? And we, we lost everybody, all our friends. It was really weird. But, yeah. you know, not again to dwell on that necessarily, but it, it, um, it's just so interesting. You're talking about that because it's like you already knew, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want to be involved in this, right? Yeah, my wife's take on it was that um, we weren't there. Well, so why should we be involved in this aspect of it? And um, and as part, Bon, is that a child died and the state of treated it like there had been um, a theft of a pack of bubble gum. Please? And, and I mean that in the sense that there wasn't a single hearing held in this matter at all. And a child died. There wasn't a trial. There wasn't a, a hearing. There wasn't let, a let alone a hearing. And so that was the frustrating part was that it just felt like, um, yeah, there was no accountability and we weren't looking for extreme punishment or anything like that. But we, I do believe in accountability mm -hmm. and that lessons need to be learned. And that if we, that's why we discipline our children, right? Um, so that they learn the lesson and they don't repeat the mistake, but mm -hmm. It was um, it was an eye opening and certainly frustrating, um, yeah, process to watch unfold. Yeah, here's a question: Would you like to see a law, uh, a social uh, host law, extended to vehicles and a situation where a parent would give uh, keys to a, a, a minor driving? One hundred percent. I mean, that's our job as parents, right? Yeah, yeah. Situations, and we entrusted the care of our child to this mother. Um, yeah, I think, and honestly, that's what burns my wife the most is that my wife was so vigilant and had such a healthy relationship with Jake mm -hmm. that, um, and she was so involved in his life and not a helicopter mom, but just had a really beautiful relationship with her son and was very involved in his life and, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. her to lose Jake under these circumstances was incredibly painful because it, it felt, um, and the facts played out that the mother wasn't watching the children. Yeah, um, she should have been. wasn't watching them. Like kids come to our house, we treat them like they're our kids. You yeah. know, it didn't seem like that was reciprocated. And so, for a mother, that's a hard pill to swallow. And yes. as a father, it was too. But my wife really struggled with that, and I and I, I understand why. I totally, totally understand <clears throat> that that would be very difficult. Uh, very difficult. Um, uh, so you're impacted, your, your world has imploded, you need to take some time, but as you say, you, you and, and, and what a wonderful career you had, obviously, and so you uh, were a motivator as part of your career in the past, right? Motivating others to, well, to win? What were you motivating them towards? Well, I was a motivator as a father, for sure. I was a sports agent. Yeah, was journey in sports marketing exec. I guess you could say I was motivating my clientele, certainly. I mean, I always like to um, inspire people to be the best that they can be. And I did that with my with, with my boys as well. Yeah, but in, so your personal disposition, see, I, I believe that our disposition, who we really are, our major, like our character traits, one could call them values, but also I believe what we're born into and how we look at life. Because of that, and I actually learned... Uh, from my daughter's uh, passing, I was a glass half full person. So that helped in my grief immediately, immediately look to what can I do to not let this ruin me, especially, right? Who we are intrinsically, I think really shapes the way we, you know, go through our grief, which I believe always, you know, will be with us at, in, in, in various ways, no matter how long we're in it. Do you believe that? I do. I think um, you hit the nail on the head. Um, and I was fortunate. I was born to two parents that um, instilled a lot of optimism, encouraged it, inspired it. Yeah. And so I grew up as an optimist. That's just my DNA and who I am and who yeah. uh, was raised to be by my 
my mother and father. And that spirit and that resilience certainly helps you get through a lot of things in life because life's not easy for anybody, right? There's ups and downs, tribulations. Yeah. But this obviously is a, a whole level of adversity on, in another spectrum. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know if I was, I, I, I fear if I wasn't an optimist, I don't know if I'd be sitting here talking to you right now. Listen, right back at you. And I have said that so many times. And um, those early days, weeks, months, and then the first few years, and then, you know, and then we change. And I have not had a guest on my show yet who's been bereaved longer than me. So I don't have anyone to say, okay, what's it like at 25 years? And I don't actually think I need to ask that question. But in the beginning, I needed to ask that in the first many years. I needed and I wanted to know, where are you? What inspired you? I'm so fascinated. I said to you just before we started recording, I'm so in, in, you know, fascinated by resilience and inspiration. So let's turn to that for a minute. Um, regardless of your background, but I love your background. Regardless, that's all gone. Who cares? You know, Jake's gone. None of that matters anymore. So what does matter? And when did you decide to to start writing Walk On? So what mattered after that was my wife and my son, Liam. That was it. Um, yeah. yeah. I needed to make sure that they got through this and that they that we got through this collectively, but also individually. And we certainly had some very tough times the first two years. Yeah. Um, it was brutal. Yeah. Perfectly honest. Um, yeah. And like I said, I'm three and a half years in now. Um, mm -hmm. Liam's doing a lot better. My wife is doing better, but still struggles mightily um, mm -hmm. with the concept, the, the thought that Jake's forever gone. I do. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, we, yeah. it is a life sentence. You carry this until your final breath. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, I just want to speak quickly to the uh, forever gone. That's a really, 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 really hard one. And um, while I haven't met, uh, really interacted, really personally or professionally with anyone bereaved longer than me, I don't know why, but I haven't. Um, I have, uh, you know, uh, engaged with people who are, you know, maybe around 15 years in or so. And um, so we, we share the same thing. So it kind of what happens, what has, for, so with everyone I've spoken with, it kind of like, you just sort of find a way to integrate it into your life. I had to find a way to, instead of compartmentalize things, which therapy sort of was teaching, no, um, I integrated it and I learned to just really, really uh, honor and respect. This is part of my life. This is who I am. But because society and culturally we're, we're so silenced as bereaved parents, largely, because nobody wants to hear about our kid dying. And that's the truth. You know, unless it's a really media sensation thing. And when all of that, all everything, you know, sort of fades away, we're still years later left with that same uh, experience. And if you're traumatized and haven't dealt with it, they've just discovered that trauma experiences are not memories. It's a reenactment in your brain kind of, I'm paraphrasing of what's going on, but they just released a study where they realized that anything traumatic that we have experienced, you can't go back and formulate it as a regular memory. They're not those, they're not stored in the same part of the brain. And so what's, re and they don't know yet how to treat that. As, as trauma therapists. So it's really interesting because um, you've got this thing sitting there and you and, and as long as you're alive and, as, and, and unless they find a way to treat it, you know, there are key moments that related to our loss. And so that realization of gone forever, you know, I played with that for a few few years on and off, but it did it did as I kind of, I think it took 10 years. And I it, here's the interesting thing. I had read uh, books at the time that said 
10 years was a really something happens. And I thought, what, how can it, how can it? So I'm not saying it's 10 years, something's going to happen. But for me, it was that piece where I really realized like, this is it Vaughn. Like this is really, this is your life. Now, some people may accept it and get, you know, get, get to this acceptance piece much, much faster. And, um, and that I honor and respect and applaud that honest to God, this is not, you know, a race between any, any, any one of us. And I always say, especially between us and our former selves. <laughs> and um, so. Individual journey, right? Exactly. My wife and I cope completely differently. Men and women grieve differently. We share yes. the same tragedy. But exactly. we're on, we're on two different train tracks and every yeah. once in a while we cross over, but yeah, uh, it's just exactly. Completely different ways in which we, um, yeah. Handle, handle, cope. And it really changes. It really, really changes over time. And that's what's so interesting. And that's why I wish there were more voices out there two and three decades in. Because what did you do? But, you know, maybe it's coming from, you know, a time where people really bought into the silence. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, that's going down another path. So when did you decide to start your book, Walk On? Well, um, it was in the uh, year two. I um, first let me backtrack and just say that um, I needed men typically in grieving need action. So we had formed two scholarships. One in literally in the days following Jake's loss, we, we were getting so many flowers. We're like, we don't need any flowers. What would Jake want? And J Jake's way to live was to lift people up and to spread joy. He was a fun loving, magnetic, authentic personality. Yeah. And he had gone on a church mission trip a year prior where our church goes to uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota and they in a particular area of the reservation called Red Shirt Table. It's one of the poorest areas on the reservation. Wow. And the young children there. And Jake really bonded with the kids there. He read to them, taught them how to read, taught them life skills, just made an impression on them and came home. They made an impression on him. And he came home and from that experience and um, was keenly aware of the inequalities that he witnessed and the differences in how he lived compared to how those children lived. And he wanted to make a difference. So we formed a scholarship that would help children from Red Shirt Table who go to Red Cloud Indian School uh, go to college. Nice. And we awarded three scholarships to three young Lakota girls that are in college. Wow. And we're happy about that. And then six months later, we formed a, another scholarship in partnership with the University of South Carolina and the athletic department. Yeah. That's where Jake wanted to go to college. That's where I went. And he wanted to follow in my footsteps. Oh. And then I felt, as his father, I felt a responsibility to make sure he got there. So we formed a, a scholarship there called the Jake Panis Walk On Scholarship. We're a walk-on football player who earns, um, represents the qualities of Jake, which is caring about his community, mm -hmm. being a good day, having grit and determination, mm -hmm. and the And um, walk-on athlete football player each year is awarded a scholarship as selected by the coach, Shane Beamer, and then mm -hmm. the recipient of the Jake Panis walk-on scholarship. Likewise, the, the first scholarship, Initially, it was named the Jake Panis Memorial Scholarship. It's been renamed the Jake Panis Walk-On Scholarship. A few separate funds. And we've been three scholarships at South Carolina and three at um, Red Cloud Indian School. Wow. So there's five scholarships now in Jake's name. Six. Oh, six. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I love it. So are they are they all called uh, the Jake Panis Walk-On? Yeah, so there are two scholarship funds, both called Jake Panis Walk-On Scholarship. Um, walk on has a special meaning because, and I we didn't realize this at the time, mm -hmm. but in Native American lore, the term walk on just means moving on to the next step in your journey. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, um, it's not a linear pathway. It's not, it, or energy. We never die. So to tie that in with the walk on football player concept, where it's, it's a student athlete who doesn't get a scholarship and has to earn their way uh, to get one, or just remains a, a walk on football player you know, part of the team, but paying their own freight. Yeah. Um, connecting those two was, was very impactful and yeah. it's been very meaningful. So that getting those scholarships launched was my first step in kind of doing something about what happened to my son and a way to honor him and honor his legacy. Mm -hmm. Then in 2021 in September, I went to the university of South Carolina to award the first scholarship. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, and when I announced the scholarship winner in front of the whole football team and the coaching staff, 
and saw the young man come forward and I just saw the joy in his face and I saw Jake in his face. Aww. That was the first time that I felt like a pivot occurred where I felt um, I can do something with, with this tragedy mm -hmm. and can mm -hmm. maybe help others. And I, I, I knew the scholarships was the first step and I saw that. Mm -hmm. And I still was struggling, admittedly. Um, yeah. You know, it's, grief is a dark place and it's, it's not linear. Right. You go up and down, there's phases to it. The, you know, one day you may think, oh my God, I'm doing so much better. But Jake, because of who Jake was, and he was such an immense personality, and he left a f large footprint. He was everywhere in our town. We lived, he lived in every time zone in the United States by, by the time he was age five. And he had friends all over the country, and he had footprints all over, and just within our town and within our county. He knew kids from other schools. He played sports. He was just, he was a outgoing extrovert with a large personality, the type of kid that when he walked into the room, he lit it up. Um, he had blonde curly hair, so he was visually stunning. Yeah. And that his energy was large. Yeah. So I had a tradition with my boys that um, I started with Jake, obviously being the firstborn. Where I, when he was about five, I started writing messages to him mm -hmm. in the mornings. And I would post them on little, I'd write them on little sticky notes, post-it notes, and I would put them on his lunch bag or on the kitchen island. And there were messages of inspiration and there were about values and traits and attributes that were positive. And it carried on with Liam when he became old enough to read as well. And the, the goal was to impart wisdom and inspiration into the developing heart, mind, and soul. Yeah. And in doing so... It just is something that I really enjoyed. I would talk to the boys about some of the messages. They'd have questions. And I was just trying to get them to find, recognize this is your pathway if you want to live a life of purpose and meaning, right? You're going to be good. You're going to be kind. You're going to serve the community and give back. All these attributes, like I said. But when Jake died, your whole belief system gets blown to smithereens. You don't believe in yeah. anything or you question everything. And I had to look inward deeply to figure out, well, I knew I was a different person for sure. I, I could feel it. I didn't, I could, you know, you look, I'm the same person on the outside, but inside I was gutted. I was a shell of myself. And I knew that I needed, if I, I, I owed it to Liam to pick myself up, mm -hmm. show him that there was a pathway forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Take a minute. It's okay. Yeah. What I wrote my boys, yeah, what I modeled for them, and did I believe it anymore? So, um, yeah. I started first, I wrote a letter to Jake, that's what started the writing, and then I thought about the all these post it notes, and um, I started reviewing them because my, my wife kept them, and my mom had actually typed up a lot of them, uh, because she's cute like that, and mm -hmm. I just started reading them. I had to make sense of them in the context of my own grief now, but also did they, were they truthful? And I set them on the right path. Did, did the, you know, you just question everything. And so as I started to revisit them and apply them to grief, I started to write about them. And then I started to write Jake's story. And it, it's almost like I was called to do it. It just flowed from there. And then I, you know, I wrote the book and I, I just wrote it for myself. Yeah. Sure. Survival initially. And then like I said, to make sure that I was going to be able to show Liam that no no matter what has happened to us, we hold our future in our hands. Mm -hmm. I believe that. I believe that. I dedicated that. the book to Liam. And, 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 um, what a gift, Stephen. What a gift. Like, really, seriously, what a gift for Liam, uh, for Jake, who I am sure is with you all the time. And, you know, we'll see all this. So something I just want to say, you uh, believe in, you believe in the afterlife? You believe that we never really die? I do. Yeah, me too. Me too. So we get that out of the way. So that's why, because some people don't, but that's, that's why the kids are, um, the kids are with us. And I've had so many experiences of my daughter visiting and a uh, funny story, I'll make this really quick, but just to give you hope and other people hope, if, if, have you had visits from Jake that you can identify as visits? Right. 100%. Right. So my daughter was with me all the time in the beginning. 
Okay, so uh, she would have been 41 on February 4th, and, and admittedly, the visits are not as frequent, okay? Maybe once, twice a year, or when I ask her, hey, hon, pop in. So, of course, I wanted a little visit, but I have let the need of that go in recent years, okay, understandably. And um, it's kind of like, mom, you know I'm around, do I have to keep popping in? That's how I interpret it. So a few years ago, I started to just let it go a little bit, unless I really need her. And so it's kind of like on her birthday, you know what, it'd be really nice if you popped in, but you don't have to. So long story short, went through the day. This year didn't do anything really special for it because that was each year just is what it is. And uh, so she started playing a little bit with elect elect electricity in the evening. And um, it was enough that it was like, okay, this hasn't happened before. So I always take things if it's happening and it really hasn't happened before. Okay, maybe. <clears throat> and I went, okay. And, and maybe three, four, five things happened. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to take that as a visit from her. I get ready for bed and I kind of went, eh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that wasn't. But you know what? I'll, I'll think it was. And that makes me feel a little bit better, right? And so... I uh, get out of the bathroom and I pick up my phone and I see that there's a phone call from my husband's phone. And I said to him, did you call me? And he goes, no, he goes, the strangest thing. My phone was just lying on the bed and it phones your phone. And I'm like, what? And so, you know, he went to pick up my phone. Hello. And it's his phone. <laughs> you know, he can hear it echoing. And so... One, a, a non-believer would look for just about anything to say it was something else. But it was like a nod and a, you really didn't believe me? Okay, here's a phone call. And so it's so much, it, it can become really fun when when that need and in pain, obviously, in many years, I needed her visits in my pain, just to make sure she is okay. So just for me personally, that sealed the deal for me. And I went, okay, I'm going to start having fun with this. So how I believe things is, you know, for me is that she's not all around me all the time, because she needs to do other things, they need to do other things wherever they are in energy form. <clears throat> but she will come and let me know I had many, many dream astral visits with her that she is still with me. Uh, but as I've needed that less, it's still reassuring and comforting. Now it's just going to be a nod and a wink and, you know, hey, mom, I'm, I'm still here kind of thing. So they never, I think the point I'm making is they never really leave us. And how often that connection is, is going to be between us and our children, right? And it's just so cool. So you've had visits as well, hey? Definitely, and and that's beautiful. That story, is that? That, yeah. I believe like there's a part of me that died in love with Jake, and there's a part of Jake that still is within me, and I'm yeah, wherever I go. So that's kind of how I look yeah. at it. things happen, and I I think that's maybe that it's those that have experienced you know um, death in this way that you're granted this experience to see that um the next realm is the veil is very thin i love what you just said though and i'm thinking so i'm going to put this out there i've never said this before so you just said you know your jake's dna is in you and your dna is in jake all true and um wouldn't it be cool if just because of that that's, that's kind of like a line to us as parents that um, it never really will go away because no matter, even if they were to come back in physical form in another incarnation as someone else, that link is still so strong and there and that energy vibration. However, um, it was making me think, yeah, maybe they are kind of really still within us. And thinking about it that way um, can remove even the separation Thanks for saying that, because it can even remove the separation I felt from, well, she's in the afterlife and I'm still here, but that DNA as energy, right? Quantum physics, all that stuff. Huh. Yeah. Maybe she is within me. I like that, what you said. See, so you taught me, Stephen. 
That's really a cool. No, seriously, I don't know if that's true. Some speaking what I feel, right? So that's all I'm speaking to is what I feel. I think I read somewhere recently, though, like DNA never dies. And scientifically, they're doing more and more with with uh, stuff like that. And I'm, I'm fascinated by quantum physics and all of that. Um, and everything happening in the in between. But anyway, that's just a fun thing. And I'm going to think about that. Because even if it is or isn't real, it doesn't matter what we what we need for us in, you know, to believe for us, that's our thing. The DNA as the link to the afterlife. That's the, the key I'm trying to, you know, express here that key change for me, as opposed to just it's there. But that could be a very real connection what I'm saying. Interesting. So I love your story of how you arrived at your book. So you're publishing soon in April and this episode is uh, audience uh, airing uh, just before publishing uh, date. We will have a link uh, to uh, your website, Stephen, and people will be able to purchase Walk On through your website as well and get information about all that. Yeah. So um, the website's really easy. It's uh, stephenpanis.com. Books available right now via pre-order uh, yeah. Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million, and but it doesn't officially launch till the sixteenth of April. So if you order sixteenth, late March, you'll at least okay. know that book on Tuesday the sixteenth. That's awesome. So I want to turn to um, resilience, and uh, so you're speaking all about that in the book. I wanted to bring the book up and its launch date at this point in the interview. Uh, we are going to just move into uh, resilience and um, motivation, and we are going to talk a little bit about values before we close this out. Uh, so um, one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about is um, what your sort of, um, I want to say this, what would you uh, tell people? So there's resilience when you're in grief and as a bereaved parent, <laughs> And then there's resilience in life, just in regular hardship and challenges. Like you said earlier, it's ups and downs for everybody in different ways. True. So in general, what would you say we need for uh, resilience? And then as a bereaved person, is there a difference or is it the exact same things that we need? So I think the one thing that everyone needs, and I, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the very bottom is air, shelter, mm-hmm. water, food. Mm-hmm. The one that's missing that I believe is should be there, it's hope. You need hope. Okay. And if you don't have hope, uh, then I think it's really tough to find your resilience muscle because we all have it. It's within us. We just have to source it and mine it. So hope is instrumental. And yeah. I'll admit, I, I was hopeless for a while. Uh, I think anybody that loses a child suddenly – is yeah. hope. Yeah. Yeah. And it took me a while to get out of the darkness. We were lucky. We've had a great therapist who's been doing nothing but grief therapy for 40 years, respected nice. it. Definitely. He saved our lives. And um, we still meet with him uh, to this day. And he's become mm-hmm. a good friend. And I think that's important too, having good therapy help where mm-hmm. you can talk yeah. about your feelings and talk about your pain. And and have it validated and have it uh, examined and realize that you're not as messed up as you think you are. You've, we all feel so alone in our grief. And so in grief particular, um, was it hope that just hope or were there a few other things that you think are a little different and required for really tough tragedy and bereavement? The difference is that the adversity is much tougher when in brief you lose a child. It's it's brutal. It's a whole nother spectrum of adversity. At the end of the day, I view grief as just a form of adversity and but a, a wicked bad one. And then one that's gonna, you know, follow you for the rest of your life. You, you can't shed grief. Um, because grief is your love. So if you shed grief is shedding your love and I I came to the conclusion that my the intensity of my grief was the just the intensity of my love for my son unconditionally. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. That's kind of the message in my book, Bon, is that this book transcends grief. So I 
we're all suffering on some level. Mm-hmm. Everyone carries an invisible backpack, and they, whether they have a malady, a, a health diagnosis, a financial crisis, yeah. they're just failing. They just lost their job. Um, their sibling went into uh, rehab. There's a million different forms of grief out there, and the ability to to overcome that starts with hope, and it builds all the answers are within us. We all have a resilience muscle. We all have hope within yeah. us. It took me a while. It's not like, oh, you just fall off a horse, get back yeah. on. Not like that. It's not like you you broke your back and the doctor says, guess what? Yeah. Well, you're going to be fully healed. Mm-hmm. There's no fully healing in grief. And time doesn't heal. I know. I'm just going to add faith and trust to the hope. So I think that the hope, I, I agree with you 100%. If you cannot find that spark of hope, that I'm, I, you said that lies within us. Everything lies within us. We just have to ignite it somehow, right? Uh, but without the hope, I think that is the absolute number one thing in grief is that spark has to be there. I hope this can get better. I hope I can get through whatever it is, whatever it is. Yeah. Then I think you really need the faith. And then I think you need the trust. And so I'm just going to, for a longer term approach, I think those things are, are critical because I think people can lose hope when they don't see results fast enough or in the way that they wanted things to work out. Yes. But when you have the faith and the trust that you are on your path and the more that uh, we learn to uh, develop an acceptance and this is our life and whatever brings us to that, right? Right that's when the faith and trust can sort of be solidified and people go, oh yeah, it is working, it is working. But just be flexible and let your hope take you where it needs to take you to find your path that you need to be on. Not everyone's going to be an author, not everyone's going to be a public speaker, not everyone's going to start anything. And a lot of people, like I love speaking to the people that are silent and because it's it's like people like us, Stephen, the percentage, probably the small percentage of the bereaved that are out kind of leading and and showing the inspiration and change and transformation as possible and all that, wherever we are, wherever we are in our journey. And so it's for all the others that are isolated and in pain and stuck and don't trust and have lost all faith. And in all of that, I'm speaking to you as well, and most especially to you, audience, because anybody that, like Stephen and I, were where you maybe are today, or maybe, you know, are a little bit better, but feel you can't go any further, Stephen and I and others who are in this space working to demonstrate transformation can happen. It really can happen. It isn't overnight, and it doesn't mean we don't have our triggers, and it doesn't mean we're not going to still feel pain and all of that. Of course we are, but it changes, and there it 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 when it just becomes part of our journey. And it and I think it needs to be a really really self respecting journey, parent bereavement, and I really think people need to just really understand and honor they've taken this on. And just give it its due grace and allow yourself to not be perfect in it, right? Because we're surrounded. The reason I'm saying that, Stephen, is because we were back 20 years ago and earlier and still to some degree are today surrounded by the um, overcoming grief, getting over grief, uh, moving on. You know, like there's a lot of that, like... uh, uh, you know, dialogue and discourse. And the flip side of that is the silence. And so that's why I'm just giving a shout out to the people who feel silenced and without a voice. Like, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I do this. Yeah. And I said to you before, and I've, and I said, I said before we recorded and I've said it on my show before. So Apple, Spotify, Google, please listen, create a category so that people in bereavement and grief can actually go and find people talking about this instead of parking it in education and mental health and religion. I mean, think about that. Like I said, grief is an individual journey. I think it's important for for anyone that is going through it in, in in whatever form that is, that they they practice self-care. They don't judge and say, well, so-and-so is doing better or 
they don't put a timeline on it. There is no your timeline is your timeline. It's everyone. It's your own individual yep. thing. What yep. when it's going to change? How it's going to change? Yeah, that's pathway. And for me, it was I started. I did a lot of reading, and I remember reading a quote, and right before I gave the speech in September 2021, and it goes from Aldous Huxley, and it said, "Experience isn't what happens to a man; it is what a man does with what happens to him." And that really left a mark, and I really marinated on that. And then I read yeah. Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. It's about how forces outside your control can take away everything you possess ex except one thing, and that's your ability to determine how you're going to respond to that situation. Yeah. Yeah. There's little on this planet, but we yeah. think we control a lot, and we control so little. It is it's how we feel, it is. we feel about what happens to us. And when I really started to embrace that concept, it became apparent that it's as simple as you have a choice. I would find anything that I could find that I could latch onto that would just give me reason to live another day. Yep. And that builds and you build momentum. Yeah. And you know, and I read some really powerful stories. I talked to a lot of people that have gone through this, their own adversity, yeah, their own form of grief. Um, I read a powerful story about a seventeen year old boy who who dove into a, a pool. And misjudged the the depth, and he mm -hmm. broke it, and became a paraplegic. He was interviewed twenty years later, and he was asked, "How has changed, and what about his life had changed?" And he his responses were so revealing. He said, "I I broke my neck. I didn't break my spirit." Yeah. Wow. He viewed his life as being abundant with meaning and purpose the last 20 years, and that but for the accident, he's not sure that the growth that he achieved as a human being would ever have occurred. And I thought, wow, that's that's an inspiring outlook and perspective. And and I uh, I relate to that mentality, yeah. that yeah. Like, who I am. And so yeah. the more I read stuff like that, the more I talked to people that were positive, and and I just focused on staying as posi as positive as I could. Like you said, I had to honor that Jake's never coming back, and that yep. that is hard to even just say. Yeah, it's hard to accept. There's part of my brain that still just won't accept that. Yeah, maybe never will. Um, I know it's the reality, but accepting it's something totally different. And I realized that I had to let go of the suffering, not let go of Jake. Yeah. So, yeah, so they're not coming back to us physically. I feel super, super blessed for those of us that have visits with them in other forms. And, um, you know, and that, all, like I said, I, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so optimistic it changes uh, for, for you where you are and me, you know, where I am almost 19 years into this now. Yeah, I, I promise you the the journey does change, but you said key things, choice. And uh, we have the choice how we want to experience life and to stay in that. So that's part of the resilience. That's part of, you know, some people really love pain. As I said to someone recently, you know, I let grief become my companion and it was my best friend for many, many years because it was the only thing that understood me. But that doesn't mean it destroyed me. In fact, I used it to propel me into everything I do. And it was a, but it was a choice. And I still remember vividly the moment I made the choice. I'm not going to let this go to waste. I'm going to do what I need to do with the experience. So we do pay a lot of attention to this uh, for people who are showing resilience and showing the way, uh, especially in disability and things like you mentioned with the individual that broke his neck in, you know, in paralysis. And, and you know, we are we look to them and feel so, so inspired. And I uh, I would take that over losing a child any day. My wife was like, I take all my limbs, but bring Jake back. Exactly. So in our in our grief space, once again, in our grief space, we do need to listen, pay attention, but most importantly, be able to readily find the voices uh, doing this. As I say, every voice counts. I want to quickly talk, um, Stephen, because I encourage audience, buy Stephen's book. I want to read your book and um, you'll get all of this in there and more. But I did just want to talk um, about values. Do you think people understand values enough today? Because how much do we talk about values? And how do they play into the, the grief process? 
I, I'm, look, I'm an optimist, so I hope we do understand values. I think they're universal and mm -hmm. um, the moral compass. So hopefully most people get values and understand the significance. And mm -hmm. um, I'll take gratitude, for example. You need gratitude if you're going to lift yourself out of a hole. Yeah. And you, you have to find something to be grateful for. And each one of us does have something to be grateful for, maybe more than just one thing. So gratitude is a great one. You, um, I started just by making a gratitude list and okay. realizing, you know what, I can, I can complain as much as I want about losing my son. I can talk about how unfair it is and why me. And I certainly did a lot of that in my introspection early on. Who does it, right? You're looking for answers. Our brains want to understand yeah. logical reasoning, but there's something in life that you're just not going to get an answer for. But there's always somebody that's worse off. You know, I thought of the children in Ukraine or in Gaza that are living just a horrible existence right now and suffering. And they have every reason to complain to and or or at any other oh, person on the planet. You know, they're in any corner of this planet, there's somebody suffering. And it's a universal concept and death is indiscriminate. This it happens to all of us. I had a friend tell me the other day, it's a great line. None of us are getting out of here alive. I love that. So, oh, yeah. You this one life, do something with it, right? And yeah. make the best of it. And um, again, it was a choice for me. And I think those values of like being kind, serving yeah. your community, being grateful, yeah. having grace, being humble, having yes. integrity, you know, standing yeah. for something, yes. um, help, be, helping your fellow man and, and woman and being a brother and a sister. We're all connected. And we're here to love one another. And a lot of that is getting lost in the discourse of today. Uh, yes. It's unfortunate, but it doesn't mean we have to um, concede to the to the uh, uncivil discourse that is going on. Uh, at the end of the day, love will conquer. And when people yeah. uh, understand that and can treat each other with more respect and dignity, I think it will be a much better place. But it takes all of us to contribute our, our part in it. And so I agree. Hopefully my book helps others. That's the goal. I wanted to help myself first and foremost, selfishly. It was my survival. It helps, hopefully it helps my family. And hopefully it helps a lot of other people that re to realize that no matter what you're suffering, um, there is a way to walk on. Um, and you're not walking away from your grief. You're just walking on with your life in, yeah. in the best way, form and shape that you can. Beautifully, beautifully said. Um, I did just want to say uh, quickly, relating to values, everything that you just said, some of the values that you identified, um, I think people uh, forget about them and, and either that or just don't pay them enough um, consideration. What are my values? And so that was the point to this is for anyone watching uh, this or listening to this um, uh, is in, in this interview with what Stephen uh, is talking about, uh, both of our losses, anybody else who has suffered a loss, anybody who has suffered anything that thinks, you know, uh, the you know, life has has sucks. It has done this to me. Um, when we can apply these values, especially in our worst adversity, our tragedy, this is where we really shine as human beings. And um, I don't think it takes that much to ignite uh, proper values. Like, so in, a, in other words, to be kind, it's very hard to be kind when you're in pain. You know, it can be very hard. Uh, one of the things I did early on in my grief is smiled at people. I was a natural smiler anyway, uh, but I literally had to force myself, but I did it and I loved it because they smiled back and uh, most, not all of them, but most of them, they had no idea. And I did that yeah, about two, three weeks in. And uh, they had no idea I had just lost my daughter to suicide, but it it helped me. I found it soothing and comforting because you share any any act of kindness, any act of a of a positive value, that energy that's in there. You do get it back tenfold, people. And I believe it is part of a healing um, unfolding within us. That it doesn't matter if it takes you the rest of your life. And a little ounce of healing, any nth of healing, nth, nth of healing is healing felt and transforms with, within us. So I love what you say. And that's all I'm saying is people pay attention to your values if you're not already. And if you are, remember them to live by them and um, share them. And I think the world would be a better place, honestly. It takes no effort to be kind. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, 
Stephen, if, coming to the top of the hour here, is there anything I have uh, not asked you, I've missed that you would like to share as a key point? You've definitely uh, shared a lot of wisdom and kindness uh, in your words for others and taught me a thing or two as well. Just uh, remind people they can go to stephenpanis.com for all information and your resources. Is there anything else you want to share? I just want to say that thank you for having me on, Bon, and thank you for being so compassionate and mm -hmm. kind. And, and I'm sorry for the loss of your daughter. I really am. And I, I appreciate that. I, I really do appreciate that. I wish we were talking about something else. We're connected today for for other reasons, and um, but I'm glad to have met you. Oh, well, I'm very glad to have met you too. It's amazing what you're doing. And so thank you again for uh, sharing what you've shared on the Grief Talk podcast. I appreciate you as well. Thank you, Vaughn. Keep up the good work. You too. <laughs>